fan turn your hymnal to 877 please this world is not my home 877 sing all four verses together 877 this world is not my home this world is not my home i'm just a passing through my treasures are laid up somewhere beyond the blue the angels beckon me from heaven's open door Please turn back to 857, please. 857, I love you, Lord. Let's sing this together twice as we prepare for the reading of the Word of God. I love you, Lord. 857.
good day and everything's going swell for you. And um, good to have you here tonight in a nice um, air conditioned uh, building this evening. And um, I was looking at the weather in Murfreesboro, Tennessee, where we were just there a while ago and it's 76 down there. <laughs> and man, man, it's 90 here. <laughs> so then I checked Yuma, Arizona because the guest speaker at the ranch was from there and that's 111. So I praise the Lord I'm here in Ohio. So. Um, Praise the Lord for that. So, uh, just a few announcements. Um, on July 17th, there is a teen hiking activity where we're going to John Bryan State Park. We meet here at the church at 8 a.m., head that way, um, hike quite a bit, um, then head over to um, uh, Young's Jersey Dairy to have lunch and then have ice cream there as well. And then we'll make our way back and for pickup around 3 o'clock. So, it may be a little bit sooner. So, uh, what teams are there, I will text parents ahead and let you know if it's going to be a little bit earlier or not, but 3 o'clock is the intended pickup time. And as well, be in prayer, Vacation Bible School um, is still going to start in August on the 2nd and runs to the 4th, that's a Monday and Wednesday. Um, I know we're still in July, but it'll be here before you know it, and so be in prayer for that as well. And, um, and I think, um, did everyone get all the ladies are going to the Indy Conference, everything to you that you need, or is there any? If there's any that haven't, then you get yeah, if, yeah, if you've not, if you've not paid uh, uh, what you need to pay, ladies who are going to the Indy Conference, uh, I almost said your dues, but not your dues, or the fee, or whatever it is, the price, uh, please see uh, my wife tonight to get that to her. Uh, ushers, you guys can come forward, please, and collect the offering this evening. Uh, tonight's offering will be going to uh, Bellville Baptist School. And um, looking forward to a... Uh, Wish the summer would slow down a little bit, but having a good summer and then school starting there. So, now, Brother Cole, will you pray for the offering tonight? Dear Lord, I'm thankful for this day to be in church. Um, I pray that you would bless the offering. I pray that you would bless the message as well. Speak to our hearts. I pray that you would help us to have safe drives home and pray by the best of our week. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. <laughs> blessing to have folks uh, fill the spots when the pastor's away and, and uh, we got kind of a special blessing Josh is uh, he's, he's really a blessing to hear preach Amen. about John and we're thankful for him and his wife and their willingness to to uh, go to the mission field and, and it's great to hear that they've got their tickets to France and they learn the language and it's pretty exciting I'll let you talk about that I did want to mention something because I have a tendency to forget things President Haiti was killed, and uh, we did. Miss County did communicate with my wife today, and 
and I also talked to the fellow the mission board there, and he said that they are uh, that they are fine, but there's a lot of gangs and a lot of violence. People are getting kidnapped and ransomed, and so so on. So uh, pray for Connie Anderson if you uh, we put her on your list and pray for her. Brother Josh, come. Well, good evening. I uh, always count it a privilege to be able to bring forth God's word, and uh, I'm really excited to see what God has for us this evening in his word, and as Pastor mentioned, uh, we did get our tickets to go to France for language school, and so we got another month and a little more, and uh, then we'll be headed that way, and that's uh, exciting for us. We've been building to get there for a while, and uh, kind of waiting on God's timing for that, and now it's uh, coming to fruition, and so we're uh, headed out soon, and so we appreciate your prayers and your prayers throughout Deputation, and uh, can't thank you enough for that. But if you will, can you join me in 1 Peter this evening? 1 Peter chapter 1. And I uh, do get the privilege to preach a few times in a row on um, these coming Wednesdays. And so we'll see if the Lord keeps us here in 1 Peter or uh, changes the direction. But uh, we're at least going to start out here and uh, read a couple verses, and so if you found it out of respect for God's word, and if you're able, would you mind standing? And uh, we'll read a few verses. We'll we'll try to make it through chapter 2 and verse 10 the, this evening, and quite a bit to cover, but before um, the prayer, I just want to read a few verses to kind of give you an overview of what we'll be looking at this evening. So if you'll join me in reading 1 Peter chapter 1, and we'll start by reading verse 3. The Bible says, Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ which according to his abundant mercy hath begotten us again unto a lively hope by the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead. And that verse there mentions a lively hope, and if you look a few verses away in verse 23, the Bible says, Being born again, not of corruptible seed, but of incorruptible, by the word of God, which liveth and abideth forever. So we see a living word there, and then in chapter 2 and verse 4, the Bible says, To whom coming as unto a living stone, Disallowed indeed of men, but chosen of God and precious. And so we have a living stone. And so I just want to talk to you this evening about uh, what the Bible says is living. And look at these three different things and see what God has for us. So let's go ahead and go to the Lord in prayer now. Dear Heavenly Father, we do thank you for your word and uh, the truth that we can find in it. And I just pray that you would uh, speak to hearts this evening. Lord, I pray for your spirit's power upon the message, Lord, that you would... Help the hearers to hear and not just hear, but be doers of your word and just apply these things to their lives and show them exactly how they can do that, Lord, that your Holy Spirit would work this evening. We just pray that you give me the exact words to say uh, for what's needed this evening. We pray all of these things in Jesus' name. Amen. And you may be seated. Uh, so here in, in 1 Peter chapter 1, uh, we'll go ahead and start reading. We'll try to get through basically every verse this evening and, and read through quickly, but uh, get what the Bible has for us. And so if we start there in verse 1, it says, Peter, an apostle of Jesus Christ, to the strangers scattered throughout Pontus, Galatia, Cappadocia, Asia, and Bithynia. And so that verse tells us, first of all, that Peter is the one that's writing this book. Uh, Peter, the apostle, the disciple of Jesus Christ. Uh, we are very familiar with Peter. He's quite the character in God's word and the one with the big mouth and the one who uh, was at the forefront of a lot of things and was one of the the tight-knit groups with Jesus Christ himself and got to see some things that the other disciples did not. Um, Jesus Christ had some very personal interactions with him, and, and he is writing this book here, and it says he's writing to the strangers scattered throughout. And uh, some people believe that would be the Jews and some uh, the Gentiles, and I think the, the epistle here is really written to both in these churches throughout Pontus, Galatia, Cappadocia, Asia, Bithynia, these different places. Peter is writing to these churches and giving them uh, an exhortation, really an encouragement, and really the theme of this book is what he's trying to get across to these people, is to look to the eternal things, uh, look to those things that are above, those things that are, that are eternal, and uh, really faithfulness through suffering, and there's, uh, he mentions different temptations and trials and things that Christians will go through, and they really kind of connect in that if you're going to get through these temptations and trials, you look to those eternal things, and that those help you get through those things. And we're going to see that as we go through 1 Peter chapter 1. And so we see Peter writing to the Christians about uh, faithfulness through suffering by looking to things above. And then we get to verse 2, and it says, Elect, according to the foreknowledge of God the Father, through sanctification of the Spirit, 
unto obedience and the sprinkling of the blood of Jesus Christ. Grace unto you and peace be multiplied. And so that first phrase there, um, elect according to the foreknowledge of God, um, a lot of people might get a little jumpy there. And uh, those are some terms where, you know, as Baptists, do we even believe in election or foreknowledge or predestination or some of these things that Calvinists have taken over? And the answer would be yes, we, we do believe in those things because it's obviously in the Word of God. Yeah. It says elect, it says foreknowledge, it says predestination. But it is important to be able to describe what these terms mean because uh, there are some different definitions that twist what the Word of God might be saying. And a lot of people will preach from this verse that elect according to the foreknowledge of God means that the election is God choosing some people to be saved, and who he doesn't elect, he chooses for them not to be saved. He arbitrarily chooses who receives grace and who doesn't, and it's according to his foreknowledge. In other words, he knows, and uh, his foreknowledge of, um, determines who gets saved. And the foreknowledge determines election is kind of what um, a lot of people will preach. And can I say this evening that foreknowledge does not determine election. God doesn't right. choose who's going to be saved. Um, there's all Again, throughout Scripture we see that salvation is for everyone. But even throughout Scripture we see that God's foreknowledge doesn't necessarily determine what's going to happen. Uh, in 1 Samuel chapter 23, we have the story of David. And he went, uh, you know, he was being chased by Saul. And there was a problem in the city of Keilah. And he went to deliver the people. And from this from those uh, the attacking of the Philistines and when he did he got himself in a predicament where the city of Keilah was surrounded and really trapped and Saul heard he had put himself into this city and he could now trap him and uh, so David went to the Lord and he said God will the men of Keilah deliver me into the hand of Saul and uh, God said yes they will if Saul comes the, the men will deliver you to him and so God foreknew what would happen but David, because of that information, decided to leave the city before Saul got there and not rely on the men of Keilah and changed um, what would happen, you could say. In other words, God's foreknowledge of knowing what happened didn't make that come to pass. His foreknowledge doesn't determine election, what's going to happen. Uh, and maybe I could illustrate it this way. Um, it'd be, maybe I, I've heard it put, and I'll make it a little more personal, uh, Brother Andy Rebovich, he's a Steelers fan, and um, I'm a Bengals fan, which is the, the correct fan to be when you're here in Ohio. And uh, let's say, Brother uh, Andy and I, we, we had a game going on, and uh, the Steelers were playing the Bengals one evening, but for some reason the NFL chooses to play on Sundays, and we, we have church, and so we're, we're in church, but we record the game. And so we have this game recorded, so when we get home, we could uh, go back and watch this game. And I end up finding out the score because somebody opened their big mouth and told me the score to the game before I was able to watch it because that happens and and uh, so if I'm going to be ruined I have to ruin it for brother Andy too and so I tell him that the Bengals end up winning and and uh, the Steelers are losers and all the, the fun trash talk that we can go back and forth with uh, but we know that the Bengals win but when we go back and watch that game and we, we know what's going to happen but does our knowing what happens cause the players to do what they do. I mean, I know an interception's coming up, but that doesn't mean I made that cornerback come and intercept the ball from the Steelers' horrible quarterback. Uh, that, that's not what happened. My foreknowledge doesn't determine what's going to happen. It doesn't, uh, it's not a, uh, the foreknowledge is not determining the uh, election with God. And that just because God knows, which he does, he's all-knowing, doesn't mean he elects some to be saved and some not to be saved. Right. And uh, we could go in a lot more depth into all the, the Calvinistic doctrine, but we don't have time this evening. But I just wanted to make this verse clear, um, that we are saved. Praise the God, we, we are elect, and we put our trust in him. But what makes us elect is us putting our trust in Jesus Christ yeah. and what he's done on the cross. And the only way of salvation, we'll see that here in this chapter, as we continue moving on to the verse 3. It says, Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, which according to his abundant mercy have begotten us again into a lively hope by the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead. And there we, we come to our first point in that we have a, a living hope. Um, and really this living hope should cause us to do some things. And, and this living hope is Jesus Christ as we see here, see here that he's risen from the dead. Uh, this hope we have, and it's interesting the, the word hope in the Bible uh, doesn't, it's never used with the uncertainty that we kind of use it with nowadays, where we say, oh, I, I hope the Bengals win, uh, or I hope this happens. 
uh, hope is always used as a confident expectation. And that the person who hopes expects something is going to happen. And they have confidence to expect that. Right. And the reason we have that confidence is because our hope is alive. He's yeah. not dead in the grave and powerless. We have Jesus Christ who's risen from the dead. And uh, again, being here in church, I, I think you believe in what the Bible says. And the Bible clearly says in, in the Gospels, all throughout the Gospels, it gives the story of Jesus Christ and his death, burial, resurrection from the dead. And, and we believe he's risen from the dead. And it's amazing how much evidence there is for the resurrection of Jesus Christ and, and that he is a living Savior. And really, as Christians, the best evidence we have of that is the Holy Spirit within us and bearing witness with ours. And right. we have a personal relationship with Jesus Christ. We know he's alive because we... We commune with him, or at least we should as Christians, and through prayer and through his living word, as again, we're going to get into later on, and I don't want to get ahead of myself. But we have a living hope where he's risen from the dead. And the interesting thing about Christianity that, that somewhat sets it apart from a lot of the other religions is that it's taken the supernatural and it's inserted it into these historical events where all throughout scripture we have historical events that have happened in Jesus Christ's death burial and resurrection was one of those historical events where there's actually a lot of evidence, just historical evidence, that what the Bible says is true yeah. uh, is backed up. And uh, really there's uh, what's called minimal facts, and I shared some of these with the adult Sunday school class in the auditorium, but uh, there's minimal facts that even the most liberal scholars will believe and not disagree with, uh, some of those being that Jesus Christ died on the cross. And there's much evidence in the crucifixion and nobody surviving a crucifixion in the medical medically you can't survive it and the, the Romans being professionals at crucifying people and executing people and then uh, being placed in the grave and then there's a minimal fact of the empty tomb uh, they you can't really deny the empty tomb one because Christianity spread in Jerusalem I mean if Peter was preaching and saying Jesus Christ is risen from the dead Somebody could just walk across the, the garden and go look at the grave and say, uh, no, he isn't right here in the grave. But there was an empty tomb because nobody yeah. could just deny what those uh, apostles were preaching and that Jesus Christ is risen from the dead, an empty tomb. And then also, even in Matthew, uh, the, the first argument against Jesus rising from the dead, what the Jews had to explain was there was an empty tomb. The, the, the way they explained it was that the disciples stole his body. But uh, there was an empty tomb, and that, that's a minimal fact. And then there's also post-mortem appearances of the disciples believing they saw Jesus Christ after he had been crucified. And again, there's evidence for that. And the, the controversy comes in and how to explain those facts. There's lots of different theories on how to fit those things together. But can I say, if we had time this evening, I would love to spend the time and show you how really the most reasonable explanation is that Jesus Christ rose from the dead. Uh, it's the only way to explain all of those right. things at once. And we have such evidence and such reason to believe the way we do. Uh, but again, the most important evidence is that you have a personal relationship with them. We have a living hope. Uh, this hope is, is founded in something that's alive and powerful. And as verse 4 would say, we see that uh, because we have a living hope, we should be able to rejoice through temptation. Uh, and that's really kind of the first thing is we have a living hope. And because of that, we can rejoice through temptation. And one reason we can rejoice through temptation is because we have a future inheritance. If you look at verse 4, it says, To an inheritance incorruptible and undefiled, and that fadeth not away, reserved in heaven for you, who are kept by the power of God through faith unto salvation, ready to be revealed in the last time. Uh, we have an inheritance that we have a reservation in heaven. If you're saved, if you put your trust in that living hope in Jesus Christ, we have a reservation, and you know, uh, myself, I have a lot of experience with uh, reservations and uh, going on deputation and staying in a lot of different hotels, and, and uh, a lot of times the churches will pay for that, that reservation, and, and uh, we'll go in the hotel and tell them our name, and then they say, Here, here's your uh, room key, go and enjoy your stay, and, and really if we compare that to our salvation, you know, we don't, we don't pay anything for salvation. Uh, Christ has paid it all. We have a reservation in heaven because of what Christ has done, because we put our trust in this living hope, not because of anything we've done. And, you know, there's a lot of people who, who live without getting reservation. You know, there's a lot of times on deputation where we've tried to drive back and make that long drive, and I realized, you know what, I don't have energy to get back. Let's stop and, and just get a hotel room and sleep through the night. But 
we didn't make reservation, we weren't planning to stop, and so I stop at a hotel and ask them for a room, and they're all booked, and I can't get a room because I don't have a reservation, and then I go to the next hotel, and they're all booked too, and I don't know what type of event's going on, but three or four hotels later, we might finally get a room, but if you don't have a reservation, you don't have a spot, and there's a lot of people that go through life and, and maybe put off that reservation. Maybe they say, oh, my parents, have, they're saved. It means I'm saved. But if you don't have a personal res a reservation, you haven't put your personal trust in Jesus Christ, you don't have that spot in heaven reserved for you. A lot of people might say, you know what, I'll just live my life and, and uh, the way I want to and then get saved before I die. And uh, maybe it's like me thinking, oh, I'm going to drive through the night and realizing my time is cut short. I, I can't make it. And, you know, you don't know when you're going to pass away or when you're right. going to die. Uh, the, James says our life is but a vapor. It appeared for a little while, but then vanished away. It is so short, and we don't know when uh, the, our time is coming. And so can I say, if you don't have a reservation, if you haven't put your trust in Jesus Christ, make sure you get that settled this evening and put your trust in what he's done and have that inheritance incorruptible. But you know that reservation that we have, it's only, it's only good if we can keep it, if the, the person who has, is reserving it for us can do that. Because I've also had an experience with a reservation where a couple years ago, um, I was getting an oil change on my car, and so I decided to make an appointment at a, at a mechanic shop and get the oil changed. And it was a few years ago, it was before COVID, we were still doing Saturday visitation. And so I decided to make my appointment on Saturday at 9 o'clock. And at 10 o'clock, we go bus visitation and door to door, etc. I figured, you know, I have an appointment, oil changes take 15 minutes, 30 minutes max. And if for some reason it takes 45, I'll still make it on time. And, and so I go in that morning to drop off my car and I go up to the desk and say, hey, I, I have an appointment for nine o'clock for an oil change. Um, here's the keys, etc." And he, the guy looks at me and says, oh, I'm sorry, we're, we're not gonna be able to get to that for another two hours or so. And we're really busy. It's like, oh, well, I actually, I, ha I scheduled an appointment online for nine o'clock. And he said, I, I know, but we, st we still, it's just a couple of hours. We're super busy. And I was just a little confused. Well, what's the point of making a reservation? I'm asking you to reserve this specific spot so I can have that spot for my car. And if you're not going to honor that, what's the point of even doing it? Why do you even have an online reservation? And, and just a little confused and long story short, uh, Brother Jeff Sutter had to come pick me up to do bus visitation. And we did an hour or two and I came back and it still wasn't done. And just really confused and then a coupon fiasco and it was just a bad experience all around. Except for Brother Jeff ended up paying for my oil change, so that helped uh, lighten the, the frustration a little bit. So that was a blessing. Uh, but again, we made a reservation, but if it's not kept, if it's not honored, it doesn't matter. But thankfully in verse 5 it says, our reservation, it's kept by the power of God through yeah. faith unto salvation. And we have a God who's keeping that reservation for us, and it's through his power that it is. It's through his power we're saved, and it's through his power that we, we can know that we have eternal life, that eternal destination reserved for us. And because of that, no matter what we're going through, for instance, in verse 6, it says, Wherein ye greatly rejoice, though now for a season, if need be, ye are in heaviness through manifold temptations. You know, there's a lot of temptations and a lot of trials that happen in this world. But throughout all of these, these things that happen in life, we can rest assured that we have a future inheritance. We have a spot reserved in heaven. We have... A, a place that is for us and that we can know there's no sin, there's no hurt, there's no pain, uh, and there's a lot we may go through here on this earth, but we can rejoice in knowing that we have a future inheritance. But not just a future, we can also, because we have a living hope, we can also rejoice because of our present joy. If we look at verse 8, it says, Whom having not seen, ye love, and whom, though now ye see him not, yet believing, ye rejoice with joy unspeakable. Full of glory. Uh, we can, through whatever temptation we're going through, know that we have Jesus Christ. We believe in him. And because of that, no matter what we're going through, we have him to be with us through it all. He is our shepherd, who, yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil. For thy, thou art with me, thy rod and thy staff, they comfort me. He's that God who, as Philippians 4, 6, and 7, we would say, Be careful for nothing, but in everything by prayer and supplication with thanksgiving, let your requests be made known unto God. And the peace of God, which passes all understanding. And we have that peace that God can provide throughout any temptation. And that present joy we can experience is something that the lost world, those that don't know Christ, just can't comprehend. 
how we're going through such hard times, how it's a, a health problem that's just so hard on us, and yet we have Jesus Christ that can comfort us, how it's a family relationship or somebody that's passed away or, or whether it's a financial difficulty or whatever temptation or trial we're going through, we can have a present joy because we believe in Jesus Christ, as verse 8 would show us. And then also, whatever temptations and trials we're going through, we are also earning uh, rewards in heaven as we go through them. Right. If you look at verse 7, it says that the trial of your faith, being much more precious than of gold that perisheth, though it be tried with fire, might be found unto praise and honor and glory at the appearing of Jesus Christ. You know, gold, it's, it's nice to have. I, I like having some money in the, the account and being able to use some, some finances to make life a little easier, but it, it perisheth. It's temporary. But what we go through through these trials and temptations of our faith, it is praise and honor and glory when Jesus Christ appears. When Jesus Christ comes back, we receive that praise and honor and glory for going through those temptations and those trials. We receive eternal reward. We're laying up our treasures in heaven as we trust in Christ through each temptation and trial. And uh, so because we have a living hope, we can rejoice through temptations. And because of that future inheritance, because of the present joy, also because of the past revelation. If you look at verses 9 through 12, it'll speak of the prophets. And they prophesied of this joy. It says, receiving the end of your faith, even the salvation of your souls, of which salvation the prophets have inquired and searched diligently, who prophesied of the grace that should come unto you, searching what or what manner of time the Spirit of Christ, which was in them, did signify, when it testified beforehand the sufferings of Christ and the glory that should follow these prophets searched and inquired, and the Holy Spirit showed them, and they were able to write prophecies of Christ's coming and suffering for our sins and that salvation they wrote about. We've received it, and because of that, we can rejoice through temptations because we have that salvation. Right. But we don't only just have a living hope to rejoice through temptations. There's also a living hope, um, and because of that, we should obey God. Uh, we should, um, because of a living hope, we should rejoice in temptation, and because of a living hope, we should obey God. And we see that in verses 13 through 21. If you look at verse 13, it says, Wherefore, because of all of this that we've just gone over, gird up the loins of your mind and be sober and hope to the end for the grace that is brought unto you at the revelation of Jesus Christ. Uh, it says because of that salvation, we need to gird up the loins of our mind. And uh, that, that means be prepared for what this life is, for what's coming. It says be sober. Later on in this book, Peter again warns, and I think it's a more familiar verse to you, in 1 Peter chapter 5 and verse 8, he says, Be sober, be vigilant, for your adversary the devil uh, walketh about seeking whom he may devour. There's a roaring lion that does this, and we need to beware of what is the, the enemy and the devil coming after us. And then as verse 14 would also say, As obedient children, not fashioning yourselves according to the former lust in your ignorance. Uh, we also need to be aware of the former lust, that old man, that flesh that we still are, are clothed in. We need to be aware and say, we need to be prepared. Gird up the loins of your mind. Guard your heart with all diligence, for out of it are the issues of life. We need to make sure we're ready. Um, a lot of Christians are, are kind of like some bench players on sports teams, um, where uh, there's a lot of players that uh, think, oh, I'm never going to get in the game. And uh, during practice, the coach will give the game plan, and he'll show you how to do certain things, and he'll show you certain plays and where to be and where to move. And uh, there's a lot of players that decide, you know what, I'm never getting in. I'm not going to pay attention, or I'll talk with my friend. And then for some reason throughout the game, maybe we're up with a big lead or down by a big uh, loss, and uh, the coach says, hey, so-and-so, you'll get in the game. And that, that bench player is uh, now thrown into the midst of the action, and all of a sudden his um, – his knowledge or lack thereof is very much shown in that he is not prepared. Uh, he has no idea where he's supposed to be or what he's supposed to be doing, and it is obvious as he's running around and completely lost because he wasn't prepared. You know, there's a lot of Christians who, who aren't prepared for what this life is, is throwing at them, whether it be Satan or whether it be flesh, and, and uh, we just aren't expecting God to use us. And a lot of us don't make ourselves available to an almighty God who wants to use us. You know, his, his team uh, doesn't have bench spots. Uh, it, it is all inclusive. It's all participation. Yeah. And uh, this church is an organism where every part and member of the body is so yeah. important. And we need to be prepared through this life because we have a living hope. And we need to obey God. 
get rid of these sins and not go according to the, the former lust. It says as obedient children. In other words, children obey without understanding necessarily everything uh, that they're obeying. Uh, for instance, if a, a child is about to touch a hot stove and uh, the mother says, no, don't touch that. The child needs to obey. Not, he, he didn't hear, oh, it's hot. He doesn't know it's hot, but he knows the authority told him to do something and he should not do it. Um, or there's a lot of times, for instance, with Adeline, and uh, she's crawling around now and she's starting to walk. And uh, it, we try to let her know, you, you know, you need to walk. It's a lot faster that way. And sometimes she'll still, she'll just get down and crawl because right now she can go faster if she's crawling. Walking takes a little bit of time, wobbling back and forth and being careful. And, and uh, she can get somewhere faster if she crawls. Uh, but she doesn't understand that even though walking may be slower now, if you continue to walk, you can gain so much more speed than you ever could crawling. And uh, just as children might not understand, and it doesn't matter how old you are, I mean, even adults do the same thing, or I'm thinking of uh, teaching some typing skills to some junior high students, and some people finger picking and saying, no, you need to not look at the keys and use your fingers, and well, Mr. Josh, I can do it so much faster this way. So, yes, you can do it faster that way now, but if you would follow the teaching, you will realize that you can go way faster when you use all your fingers than if you would just use two, and again, it doesn't matter if you're junior high adults, we do the same thing. We think we know a certain way, and when God says to do something, we, we start putting in our input. And we start saying, God, I don't know, I can do it faster this way, or God, I think I'd rather have it this way. And instead of just obeying God like children should, yeah. instead of not understanding necessarily everything and just saying, all right, God, I may not understand, but this is what your word says to do, so I'm going to obey you. A lot of Christians go the route of, God, I'd rather understand everything, or God, I'd rather give you my input or my counsel, or you should maybe listen to me in this area. And a lot of Christians don't obey, whereas the Bible says we should obey uh, just as obedient children, not necessarily understanding everything, but knowing that God is in control. He's all-knowing. We have a living hope, and that's who our hope is in. I hope your hope is not in yourself. That was a lot of hopes in the same sentence, but I, I hope you're not trusting in yourself because uh, we, we fail constantly, but we have a living hope who we yeah. can put our trust in and know that if we obey him, we have the best. Uh, he has the best for us in mind, and we can obey uh, because he's told us to, because he's coming back is really what verse 13 says. Uh, we need to obey because of uh, the grace that is to be brought unto you at the revelation of Jesus Christ. He's going to be revealed in the end times, but not just obey because he's coming back. We need to obey because God is holy. If you look at verse 15... It says, but as he which hath called you is holy, so be ye holy. In all manner of conversations, because it is written, be ye holy, for I am holy. We need to be holy because that's the way God is. And we, need, we are representatives of him. And we need to represent as we are family of, of God. We're sons, uh, joint heirs with Christ. We're God is our heavenly father. We're representatives of him. We need to be holy as he is holy. That's why we need to obey him because He's given us the example to follow. And so we need to obey because he's coming back, because he's holy, but also because he's redeemed us. If you look at verse 18, it says, For as much as ye know that ye were not redeemed with corruptible things, as silver and gold, from your vain conversation received by tradition from your fathers, but with the precious blood of Christ, as of a lamb without blemish and without spot. And we see that we're not redeemed by corruptible things. You, you can't buy your way to heaven. Uh, you can't give your silver and your gold and say, all right, God, I, I'm paying my way into heaven. Uh, I made all this during, during my lifetime and was a wise steward of my money. And, and uh, we start saying, I've done this and done this. And uh, I believe it was mentioned recently in a sermon in Matthew 7 how there will be many people that say, Lord, Lord, have we not prophesied in thy name? Have we not done all of these things? And the Lord will say, depart from me. I never knew thee. Never knew you. And uh, because we don't buy our salvation, we're not redeemed with the corruptible things, with our works, uh, with gold or silver, with these, these temporary things from this earth, uh, our vain conversation. We're not, we're not saved by tradition from our fathers. It's not because um, our parents are saved or we're second or third generation uh, supposedly Christians. If you haven't put your trust in Jesus Christ, if you haven't been, as verse 19 says, bought with the precious blood, of Christ as a lamb without blemish and without spot. 
You don't have that eternal life, that reservation in heaven for you. That is the only way of salvation, as John 14, 6 would say. I'm the way, the truth, and the life. No man cometh unto the Father but by me. And so we need to realize it's the precious blood of Christ that has saved us. And when we think of what Christ went through, uh, and, and, you know, the blood is, is an interesting thing. We, we have many songs about it, and I've always thought as we're singing, you know, what can wash away my sins, nothing but the blood of Jesus, and all these songs about the blood, and just wondering if somebody from the world came in and was listening to us sing, and just the, the oddity of singing about blood. And I, even in junior church, we were singing deep and wide, and uh, deep and wide, there's a fountain floweth. Um, and it's an interesting song because a lot of people don't realize the spiritual significance. It's just motions. It's just something fun. But the fountain that floweth deep and wide is Jesus' blood. Right. And uh, I, I mentioned, you know, what is that fountain? And mentioned that uh, one of the kids mentioned is it's Jesus' blood. And one of the, the kids is like, what? Blood? And uh, it is. It's a, it's a little weird to be singing about blood. But when you realize the significance of what Jesus did with right. his blood, how he shed that blood for you, how we deserve death because of our sins, how we're sinners and we deserve it. Yet Jesus Christ, the perfect God himself who came down in human form and lived that perfect life, took our place and shed his blood for you. It takes on a whole new meaning, and it means so much to us because that is the way that, that God has ordained that we are saved. And it says in verse 20, it says that who verily was foreordained before the foundation of the world, but was manifest in these last times for you. This was God's plan from the foundation of the world. He, he knew man was going to sin and be sinners, and he knew there needed to be a price to be paid. And he ordained that Jesus Christ could pay that price, that he could reconcile, really redeem is the word that's used here, buy us back to himself through that blood of Jesus Christ. And we can realize that we need to obey God because of all that he's done for us and obeying him uh, because of of all that he's done all that he's suffered and uh, so many Christians again we, we put our trust in Jesus Christ for salvation and then we go right back into bondage we go right back into sin and we go right back into putting ourselves under um, the the consequences of what we've really been saved from and can I say after salvation as even verse 2 would say, we're unto obedience. Where, uh, as Ephesians 2 would say, we're saved, for by grace are you saved through faith, and then not of yourselves. It is a gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. We, we kind of stop there most of the time, and we say, yeah, Christ saved you. It's only by faith. It's not through works. It's kind of what I've just been saying from this passage, because, again, it's all throughout Scripture, the only one way of salvation. But verse 10 says, for we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus through good works, and we're saved to obey him. We're saved to be conformed to the image of his son. We're saved to become more like Christ and be holy as I am holy, as the Bible would say, as God would say. And so can I say as, as Christians, we can uh, have a living hope. Uh, and because of that living hope, we can rejoice through so much temptation, through so much trial, through so much suffering. Because of a future inheritance, because of a present joy, because of the past revelation showing us of our salvation. But also, because of that living hope, we should obey uh, because of what Jesus Christ has done for us, because um, he, has, uh, he is holy, because he's coming back, because we know he's living and therefore he's coming back, because uh, he's redeemed us with his blood, as verse 21 would say, who by him do believe in God that raised him up from the dead and gave him glory that your faith and hope might be in God. And that's truly where our faith and hope should be. It's in God. And it's because of that living hope that we can have this assurance we can have and know what Christ has done for us. And uh, we really should obey consistently what God's word says. And again, not put our own uh, input on what God's word and try to twist it to be what we need it to be or what we want it to be. But just take God's word for what it says and obey it as obedient children and following him day by day and seeing what he can do with our lives. And finally, um, through this first point, we, we have a living hope. Uh, and we need to rejoice in temptation because of it. We need to obey God, but we also need to love the brethren. And we see that in verse 22. It says, Seeing ye have purified your souls, and obeying the truth through the Spirit, unto unfeigned love of the brethren, see that ye love one another with a pure heart fervently. You know, the, the Bible says, um, because of this living hope, we need to love the brethren. 
And that brethren, again, is it's not a respecter of persons, brethren. Uh, again, I, don't, I think I may have skipped over it, but in verse 17 it says, And if you call on the Father who without respect of persons judges. Um, God has never been a respecter of persons. Again, in Colossians 3 would confirm that as well. All, again, all throughout Scripture it shows that God doesn't respect certain persons and not others. Uh, in other words, same with Calvin. He doesn't choose certain people to be saved and not others. Uh, he doesn't choose white people to be saved and black people not to be. He doesn't say he doesn't choose rich people to be saved and poor people not to be. He doesn't choose anything by respect of persons, by who you are. We are. It doesn't matter if you're Jew or Gentile, bond or free, as Colossians right. three would say. We're all in Christ, yeah. and that's what's important. And can I say the love of the brethren again is the same way? It's just like Christ, where it's not a respecting of persons, where we love certain people and and not others. Uh, we we respect all people, and we specifically love the brethren, the church, uh, our church family, um, with an unfeigned love. And you know, there's a lot of times where we can uh, fake friendship and fake love. Uh, I know in college, um, I I enjoyed playing um, and basically anything with a ball, soccer, basketball, or ping pong. And, and there was a a guy who. Um, I had some extra time, and so we would go to the student activity center, and I would play some ping pong, and he, he started talking with me, and we started playing ping pong, and started to build a friendship, and I, I have to admit, at first, um, it was a little bit of a, a faked friendship. Um, it wasn't necessarily, it wasn't the most uh, connective, it wasn't the most uh, connective with me, and that uh, we didn't have a lot in common. Uh, he wasn't really that good at ping pong, so it wasn't as fun to play with him. He had a, a little awkward personality. He was southern with the southern drawl, and it was just, we were different. And uh, although I was friendly and I, I enjoyed spending some time with him, I definitely enjoyed spending time with other people a little bit more. But uh, as we grew in friendship, and as we started playing a little more, uh, it was amazing how we, we did. We got closer, and we became true friends in that uh, I wasn't faking enjoying being around him. Uh, and I, I love being around him. He's one of my best friends to this day. I was able to go to his, his church uh, not too long ago and, and see him again, and, and it was an encouragement. Uh, but a lot of times we do, we, we fake friendships or we fake being nice to each other. And, and sadly, it, even among Christians, there is. There's so much bitterness. There's so much divide where somebody has offended me, and so I can never uh, love them or love that, that brethren or sistren, uh, however you want to say it. Uh, we, we say... I mean, I know the Bible says I'm supposed to, to love them, but you don't know what they've done to me, and you don't know uh, who they are, or what type of person they are, and, and again, we start putting all these parameters on what God's Word says, and uh, instead of uh, having this true love, we, we have this feigned love, and we'll, we'll be civil around the other person, and we'll, we'll act like we, we're good buds and we like the other person, but in our heart, that bitterness is deep. And we, we can't stand being around that person. And every time that person comes in the room, we have to leave or else um, it starts building up until maybe we can't fake it anymore and something bursts out. But sadly, uh, there is a lot of times in, in churches, not an unfeigned love, but a, a very much feigned, a fake love between one another. And can I say, we have a living hope. And uh, we have Jesus Christ as the ultimate example. And one that's saying, be kind one to another tenderhearted, forgiving one another, even as Christ Jesus has forgiven you. And uh, we, again, have such problems sometimes with forgiving somebody and then truly putting it behind us. And uh, that, that needs to be settled because right. as a living hope, we have a Jesus Christ in our hearts. We should love the brethren, love every single person and, and have that unity. And really, again, uh, Ephesians is good by, by presenting unity of the church and the necessity of that. But this church is a body. It's an organism, and when things don't work together in the body, um, some, some bad things happen. Um, I, there are some very clumsy people who aren't necessarily skilled with controlling their body, and uh, when they don't control it very well, a lot of accidents happen because when one member isn't working correctly, uh, it can cause a lot of pain. And uh, that's the same with the church, where the, the Bible says in 1 Corinthians chapter 12 that this, this is an organism, this is a living body, and each and every one of you is important, and we need to be unified in the ultimate goal, which is, is getting the gospel of Jesus Christ out. Yeah. And uh, it's your job, as a, putting your faith in that living hope, to love the brethren, an unfeigned love, 
And it says, see that you love one another with a pure heart and fervently. We're not just supposed to love them genuinely, but fervently. We're supposed to be passionate about giving to others and helping others and loving others and uh, loving our neighbor as ourself. And, and uh, I, again, the Bible doesn't say much, but it, it's clear that we love ourselves a whole lot. Um, we, we love and want to protect ourselves, and we want the best for ourselves, and we're supposed to love our neighbors and love our, our brethren fervently and care for each other and help each other and be there for one another and provoke one another to love and good works, as Hebrews 10 would say. And that's, that's a, a command that Christ gives us here in 1 Peter chapter 1 and verse 22, is that because of the living hope, we need to love the brethren. And so because of this living hope, I, I, just a little bit in review, because I'm speaking quickly, because I'm trying to get through more than I probably should have um, bit off, but uh, we need to rejoice in temptation, uh, we need to obey God, and we need to love the brethren because of this living hope. But then we get to verse 23, and we see this living word. And it says, being born again, not of corruptible seed, but of incorruptible, by the word of God, which liveth and abideth forever. And you know, because of this living word, we should rejoice in its, in its permanency and its reliability. It says that this is incorruptible word. Um, God has preserved his word. Amen. And it is incorruptible. Not, not that you know, there's something that uh, can be corrupted. This is unable to be corrupted. This is a permanent word. It says it liveth and abideth forever. It says in verse 24, it kind of gives a contrast. It says, for all flesh is as grass, all the glory of man, it says the flower of the grass, but the, glass, the grass withereth, and the flower thereof falleth away. Uh, these, these things of man, they, they expire. They're temporary. This world is temporary, whatever's on it. Uh, I think of maybe uh, some coupons, and they expire, and uh, sometimes... I have this coupon because I know we eat at this restaurant sometimes, and I just stick it in the, one of our desk drawers or I stick it in my wallet. And then uh, somewhere down the road, we go to this restaurant, and I think, oh, I've been saving a coupon for this moment. And I pull out that coupon, and for some reason, it always happens to be expired. <laughs> and uh, it just doesn't last. And I want to use it, but it, it doesn't last. And, and just a typical, just a small example, but this, this whole world, these, these temporal things compare nothing with the eternal things like God's word. And it says in verse 25, we should have some assurance because it says, but the word of the Lord endureth forever. And this is the word by which the gospel is preached unto you. Amen. He goes and he proves this word is forever. It's incorruptible. And it's this word, the, the word that's forever and incorruptible. It's this word that your hope is based on. And right. so that is, that, if that's not the most comforting assurance that we can have, uh, I don't know what is. And that's, that's what Peter here is trying to say is we have an incorruptible word. We have a, a living word. It liveth and abideth forever. Jesus Christ himself, God himself. And because of this, uh, we can have, uh, we can rejoice in its reliability and its permanency, but we should also do some certain things. And we see that here in chapter 2. Because of this living word, verse 1 says, Wherefore, because of all of this, laying aside all malice and all guile and hypocrisies and envies and all evil speakings. It is um, as newborn babes, we should desire the sincere milk of the word that you may grow thereby. Um, because of this living word, we need to lay aside some things. Uh, Peter lifts some specific things here. We need to lay aside malice, hate, or that bitterness that I was referring to earlier. We need to lay aside guile, that deception, Again, we can um, deceive people in thinking that we, we love somebody and we're, when we're faking it. Um, we need to lay aside hypocrisies and saying, you know what, I believe this, and then acting a completely different way. In other words, laying aside the sin. And I, again, I, I think I mentioned this in our, our Sunday school class recently, but I think one of the biggest things that deters the lost people from coming to Christ is the Christian's hypocrisy and that they see the way we live. And it's no different from the way they live. Well, why would they want what we have if it's no different? If a Christian's not living differently. And again, we'll, we'll get into throughout First Peter how we're a peculiar people and how we should be different, separated from the world, and living holy as we obey God, as we've seen in these former verses. But we should be different from the world by laying aside malice, laying aside guile, laying aside hypocrisy, laying aside envies. I think a pastor preached on this recently in, in uh, coveting and envying something you don't have and instead of being happy for that person or uh, loving that brother and being happy for what he's given saying why can't I have a red Corvette or a 
nice Dodge car, or why can't I have this, or why can't I have that, and we start envying this, and we start envying that, and, and uh, we have a living word that is here forever, and it shows us how we're supposed to live, how we're supposed to obey, and yeah. it's laying aside envy, it's laying aside hypocrisy, it's laying aside evil speakings, the filthy communication, as Colossians 3 would word it, it's keeping our mouths pure. James 3 is very clear on uh, how dangerous the tongue can be. Proverbs 18, 21 says, death and life are in the power of the tongue. Uh, the, the tongue is a powerful instrument. And uh, so many times, as Christians, we make horrible use of it. And uh, James 3, again, says, does a, a, a fountain bring forth at the same place both sweet water and bitter? Uh, no. And our tongue, for some reason, brings forth sweet and bitter. Um, again, uh, the, there's a saying, you know, would you kiss your mother with that mouth? Because it's, it's uh, kind of bringing out the point that James 3 is. Uh, you're using your mouth to do um, good things and loving your mom or your wife or your kids, and you're also using it to say this filthy junk. Uh, it's not, that's not how it should work. And the Bible is saying, laying aside all of these things, because of this eternal word, because of this eternal word, we need to desire it. As verse 2 would say, as newborn babes desire the sincere milk of the word. We need to get into God's word and want to know what it says. Uh, again, having Adeline uh, recently, and uh, she'll let you know when she's hungry um, and wanting some milk. And uh, as a baby growing up, and in the middle of the night, she'll wake up and she'll wake you up and let you know, hey, I am desiring some milk. You should get that to me immediately. And uh, screaming and crying. And it's amazing as she's growing, she, uh, she hasn't stopped wanting food and milk. In fact, she seems like she's a bottomless pit, and she just keeps eating and uh, wanting this and wanting that. And um, it's, it's been nice because uh, having a wife, um, she, she enjoys food as much as I do. And so thankfully, I didn't marry a wife where, you know, I say, do you want anything? And she says no, and then she says, oh, can I have some of your this or that? Uh, she, she says, yes, I want something, and she'll get her own, and that's, that's been a blessing and a privilege. And it's, it's also a blessing that she's a little picky, so she normally doesn't want what I have, and so I can keep all of my food. But now Adeline's growing up, and it seems that every time I'm eating, of course she wants what I'm having, and uh, she desires anything that I'm eating, and I can't hide it. She always comes in the room when I'm trying to sneak a cookie or something, and uh, she wants it, and she desires it. As she's growing up, it, it hasn't stopped. And you know, as Christians, I don't know if you remember when you were first saved, but you got into God's word and you started learning some new things and you started desiring and you wanted to know more. And you wanted to know and say, wow, uh, this, is, this is new, this is exciting, I've never heard this before and I, I need to live for Christ and I need to share the gospel and I need to do all these things. And then as we've grown, maybe our desire has uh, started waning. Our desire has started uh, dwindling. And our desire is not really there as it used to be. And our desire, as we're growing, shouldn't stop. In fact, we should, as the Bible says in another passage, get into the meat as well. Adeline's getting into some uh, adult food, not just milk. And we as Christians need to get into God's word and desire it. And uh, I don't know if you've lost your desire, but we need to, as God's word says, we have a, a living, eternal word that we can get into and know what it says, know what God wants for us. And uh, I, I heard a message preached by Brother uh, Scott Pauley about desire. Proverbs 18.1 says the, that we can do some things. We need to separate ourselves. Um, in other words, obey God, lay aside sin, as verse 1 says. And uh, we need to seek. And again, as verse 2 says, we need to get into God's word. And if you're, you're struggling with that desire and, and learning, um, just some practical suggestions would be make sure you get into God's word every day. And maybe yeah. spend a little extra time in it and trying right. to get something from God. Um, live a life of faith and obedience. Um, there's a lot of times where um, people will just stop growing, and so they, they don't get anything new from God. Maybe you, you, uh, you're perfect, uh, or, and obviously I'm kidding, nobody's perfect, but a lot of times a message is preached and we say, oh, I've already got that down, I've already got that down, uh, I don't need to make any changes there, I don't need to make any changes there, and we're not asking God to examine our hearts and show us what needs to be changed, and we're not asking God to speak to us. We're not coming to church even wanting to hear what God's word says. Uh, we're just coming out of duty or because we want to be a good example to our kids or you fill in the blank. A lot of times we're, we're not desiring anything from God. And uh, we should be as newborn babes where we're just, we can't live without it. We have to, maybe uh, an, a helpful tip would be to find somebody that you can talk with about God's word. Find uh, somebody that you can maybe have accountability with. 
um, especially have accountability with, but then discuss what you read. A spouse would be a great opportunity in, in talking with them. Maybe it's your child and teaching them, hey, I read this in devotions this morning. Maybe it's a friend and you say, you know what? I, I just want to share with you what I read in my devotions this morning and share what you've learned and help somebody else learn something new and get that desire back for, that, for this living and incorruptible word. Um, and then finally in verse 4, we see a living stone. And I don't think we'll have time to go through all of this, but this living stone is Jesus Christ. And it says in verse 5 that we're also lively stones. We are um, the church. And this, this passage here gets into the yeah. church. And in verse 9, if I can conclude by saying it says, You're a chosen generation, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a peculiar people, that ye should show forth the praises of him who hath called you out of darkness and into his marvelous light. Uh, because of this living stone, we should show forth the praises of God. Uh, we're a holy nation. We should be holy, obeying God. We've already discussed that. We're a peculiar people. Again, when we're holy and different from the world, it's peculiar to the world. Uh, we're a, a royal priesthood. We have the priesthood of the believer where we can go to God. And I preached on that the last Wednesday I preached with Hebrews chapter 10 and how Christ is that new and living way. He gives us access to God as there's one mediator between God and man, the man Christ Jesus. And we are a, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a peculiar people, and we should show forth this praises. In other words, we should be the witness that Christ has given us to be. Uh, the church is what God has promised to use in this day and age. It's his instrument. It's his body. He's the head, or he's the cornerstone, as Peter would use in this example. And uh, where are those stones that build up the church? And again, the, the church isn't this wonderful air-conditioned building we have. It's, it's you. Amen. And uh, you should be showing forth the praises of God and giving the gospel to others. And so can I just say, this, this passage here shows us that this, this is not a, a religion that we're just kind of doing steps to hope, hope uh, we get through. Uh, this is a relationship, a living relationship with yeah. a living hope, a living word, a living stone, and we have a, a living God that we can commune with. And can I say, I, I've gone over a lot this evening. If there's something that's, that's spoken to your heart, that the Lord's kind of pricked your heart about, the Holy Spirit has given you something that you say, you know what, I do need to change this. I need to lay aside something. I need to obey this that I've been putting off. I need to uh, uh, get into God's word more. I need that desire back. Can we make a decision tonight to, to go to the Lord and ask him for that? Ask him for that help. Uh, make that decision to do what God's word says to do. Because of this living hope, because of this living word, and because of this living stone, let's apply what has been uh, taught tonight from God's word. Uh, let's go ahead and, and close in prayer and ask for God's help in all of this. Dear God, I do thank you again for using holy men of God to move them to write your uncorruptible word. Lord, this, this word that we can glean and know what you want for us, Lord. And I pray this evening that you would work in hearts tonight, that you would show them exactly what needs to be changed, that you would show them what needs to be applied even this week, even today, even tomorrow, Lord. I pray that you would have decisions be made this evening that uh, would uh, change their lives, that would uh, change my life, Lord. That again, that I would get right with you, Lord. And uh, because of what you've shown us this evening, decisions will be made to, to honor and glorify you and to, to bring this word to others. Lord, that we would be witnesses to our coworkers, to the grocery store clerk, to everybody that comes into contact with us, Lord, that we would uh, have a desire to share your word with them. And dear Heavenly Father, we pray this all in Jesus' name.